Jacob Hostetler was an Amish Mennonite that migrated to Pennsylvania in the 1700s from Switzerland. So he was settled there with his family out in the country. And at the time, William Penn was in charge of Pennsylvania. And the relations with Indians at that time were very hospitable. They all lived together. They ate together. They there was no problems. Well, along came the French and Indian War and things changed. So what I'm going to share with you today is the story of Jacob Hostetler and how part of his family was massacred during this time period. And what were the events that led up to this that caused it? I'm also going to share with you what encouraged me to even talk about this. I had shared another video on my channel and one of the one of my subscribers had answered and made a comment um, letting me know that they were a descendant of the Jacob Hostetler family. I can read it for you here. I'm a descendant of Jacob Hostetler, who was part of the North Kill Settlement. It was the first organized Amish Mennonite congregation in America, and it was established in 1740. His family were the unfortunate victims of the Hostetler Massacre on September 29, 1757. So thank you, Samantha Wise, for inspiring me to do a little bit of research and share this story. We also, my husband, I was telling him about it and he went and um, talked with a couple of local Amish friends and they were yet like, yes, our children learn about this in school. And that inspired me to get a book that he was talking about called The Hosh Detler Story. And in this book, it will tell you the story of the massacre and it also shows some genealogy showing the descendants from uh, Jacob Hostetler. So it's very interesting. Um, I have a link below if you're interested in getting more details in that book. But let me go ahead and share the story with you today. On the evening of September 19th, 1757, the young people of the neighborhood gathered at the home of Jacob Hostetler to assist in paring and slicing apples for drying. It was the custom of the young people to have a social to frolic after the work was done, and sometimes it continued well into the night. After the folks departed and the family had retired, their dog made an unusual noise, which woke up the son, Joseph, who opened the door and received a shot in the leg. He realized in a moment that they were being attacked by Indians and managed to lock the door before the Indians could enter. In an instant, the family were on their feet. The Indians, seven to ten in number, with three French scouts, were seen standing near the outdoor bake oven in consultation. There was no moon that night. There were several guns and plenty of ammunition at hand. The two sons, Joseph and Christian, picked up their guns to defend the family. Two or three could be shot and the guns reloaded before the Indians could enter. But their father firmly believing in the doctrine of non-resistance and remaining faithful in his hour of sorest trial, could not give his consent for defense. In vain, his family begged him, but he continued to tell them it was not right to take the life of another, even to save one's own life. What a night of horror this God-fearing family must have spent the last hours while the timber wolves were howling and the owls hooting their calls with the dogs barking and seeing their fate outside at the hands of the Indians. At daybreak, the birds began singing their songs of peace but for the Jacob Hostetler family, there was no peace. Even afterwards, Joseph claimed the family could have been saved had his father given consent, as he and his brother were both good marksmen. Their father was also, and the Indians never stood fire unless under cover. At daybreak, the house was set afire, and the family fled to the cellar, throwing cider on the burning spots. Finally, the Indians left one by one, and the family felt that they could no longer remain in the smoke-filled cellar. They quietly proceeded to climb out through a small window, but one warrior, Tom Lyons, who had stayed behind eating some peaches, saw the mother, who was a fleshy woman, having difficulty getting out, and he sounded the alarm. The others quickly returned to find that he had stabbed her in the back with a butcher knife. Besides killing and scalping the mother, they killed the daughter and her son Jacob Jr. and captured Joseph, Christian, and Jacob Jr. Apparently, Jacob was considered a safe prisoner, and they gave him the job of bringing in the meat for the camp when the warriors were gone. He was given a gun and had to account for each bit of powder and shot that he used. He found a place in the woods, and each day he stored a bullet or a bit of powder, there in hope of his eventual escape, slowly gathering up his courage over time. He finally fled alone, not knowing where he was or the direction of his home. He found a river, built a raft, and drifted downstream with his meager supplies. Near present-day Harrisburg, he was spotted by someone who took a skiff out to get him by the time he was too feeble to stand.
He was given food and clothing and regained his health. He had also been held captive for three years, and although he had returned home, he was concerned for his children who remained captive. With a friend's help, as Jacob himself did not write, he sent a petition to Governor Hamilton for help in recovering his sons, Joseph and Christian. It's dated August 13, 1762, and can be found in the Pennsylvania archives. Christian had been adopted into full fellowship with the Indians. He was with them approximately seven years. One day he returned home on his own to find his family eating dinner. Thinking he was an Indian, they offered him some food. He accepted, but took the food outside and ate it while sitting on a stump. Jacob Sr., after finishing his meal, went out to talk to him. At that point, in broken German, he said, My name is Christian Hostetler. He was joyously received, but some time elapsed before he could again take up the white man's ways. He later married and joined the Tunker Church, Church of the Brethren, in that area. Later, in October of 1764, a colonel banquet called a council with the Indians who had been badly defeated by the army and demanded that the Indians return the white prisoners. In November, the Delaware chiefs returned in all but 12 of the prisoners, but the colonel would not shake hands with the chiefs until all the prisoners were returned. Finally, on May 8, 1765, a treaty of peace was signed. We don't know if Joseph was returned in the fall or early spring, but we do know that the Indians wanted him to remain with them. Even after his capture and return, he continued to hunt and fish often with the Indians. Later, he became a landowner and married. So this is not uncommon. Uh, during the French and Indian War, the Indians, um, they li did live peaceably at first, but then when the war started, the French started to coerce them, um, maybe paying them more, giving them alcohol, tr giving them better trades than the English, and coerce them to go against the English. The French and the English were fighting over land in Canada and the northern port part of the United States, and they enticed the Indians to get involved. So it wasn't that they were savage or anything like that. It's just that they were giving an offer, and so they attacked um, their neighbors um, based on that. When white prisoners were taken especially as children it wasn't unusual for them not to want to return home because you have to think they were raised with Indian families and that became their family so I'm sure Joseph struggled with that because they did not harm him he had a life with them and they taught him many of their skills so it was good to hear that he still kept in contact and was able to live both lives. I do have two links below. One is for another expert of this story. Um, you can read it below. And then again, there's a, a link below for the book. You can go ahead and get that too. And thank you again for uh, Samantha for sharing that story. Um, this was intriguing. I never thought about the Amish being here during some of the pioneer days of our times. So they also were taking part in that as well. You have a blessed day and I hope you enjoyed um, a little bit of history today.